USOs kicking off the unbiased UFO report. Unidentified submerged objects. Let's head into the oceans where the megalodon lives, the super sharks, the bull sharks, great white sharks, lebed sharks, and every type of shark that wants to eat people. John, take it away. What happened? Yeah, actually, I just made that one up. I like the way USO sounds. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, uh, it was actually very funny because I actually had a, I had a friend of mine who's um, a, a, a top-notch physicist and doing some very fascinating research. Actually reached out to me yesterday because he was going to be going to a meeting uh, talking to some people about USOs and was trying to ask me information about it. So it was completely timely that this came out. And um, what's really interesting about this little quote, um, which I'll read first, um, is, uh, is who endorsed it. So first... We have a message from Ross Coldhart, who you all know and love. And if you don't, he is the um, lovely um, uh, correspondent from um, uh, Australia that wrote the fantastic book. So he says, uh, today, the former head of the French spy agency DGSE has said UAPs were detected moving underwater at the speed of sound. That is the equivalent to one mile in 4.69 seconds. There is a YouTube link uh, to part of the interview. Um, that includes Prince uh, uh, Bryce Zabel, and uh, and he uh, is is bringing uh, some aspects to the story as well. And what you had is you had Ross making that comment on the seventeenth, and then you had Luis Elizondo basically resending that out to a bunch of people with an additional comment. Amen, Ross. And I got to admit, like there's there's almost no substance to what I'm about to say. But coming from Lou Elizondo in the context of the conversation, I'm kind of shocked he said what he said. Uh, Amen, Ross. Thank you for this provocative statement. People will be blown away when they finally find out the true performance capabilities of these transmedium technologies. Now, there's nothing to hang your hat on in that statement. But clearly, he was trying to throw as many virtual bones as he could to as many people as he could. Why is he doing that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, hopefully it's all for very, very good reasons. But my point is, is that this is, this is, this is, there's a lot of carrots in this statement. Okay. So why should we be focusing on the waterways with USOs? Oh, bother. Um, where to begin? Um, you know, honestly, Dave, you could go at that from so many different angles. You can look at it from the statistics of how many of them come out of the water and how many of them are seen above the ocean and coming out and going back into the ocean. You could look at it from uh, anecdotal reports from people. You could also look at it from terms of uh, proximity of crash sites, proximity of sightings, proximity of military um, uh, um, uh, events. You can look at it in terms of military operations. And then how I like to look at it is in terms of possible energy um, supply. Although another very good angle is to look at the hidden nature of the ocean and how easy it would be to actually have large installations down there without anyone noticing, which is certainly a factor. Um, but for me, it's the fact that if you have a species, assuming that this is a physical species that travels a distance, and that is, that is an assumption by all means, um, it, they will have some sort of a very compact fuel source. The most compact fuel source we know of that the universe creates, the universe does this, we don't, is the sun. So to think that the ocean would become a harvesting point for them from a deuterium point of view or, or you know, basically heavy water, um, being able to have a place where you can hide and you can actually possibly replenish your engines over a very slow period of time. So no notices. I mean, that that's a I, I, to me. To me, like, if you didn't go into the ocean, you'd be seen as incompetent. Maybe the ocean is a fuel source. Sure it is. It's going to be for us. Someday. 3% of that ocean is, is, is you know, the good stuff. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the, the big thing is, like, with Luis Elizondo... Uh, tweeting out about this and supporting work, it really goes to show that there is hard work being done from those who, proper journalists who are covering this field of ufology. I mean, we complain all the time about the mainstream media not picking it up. Sure, Ross Coltart may be a, a massive 
George Knapp type name, Walter Cronkite type name in Australia, but it is going to get picked up over here eventually. And the fact is, as long as we're talking, as long as that information is flowing, as long as sources are giving some information up, there is still a little bit more than just breadcrumbs falling on the ground. Yeah. Oh, and, and there's also a psychological aspect of this as well, because I, I've been in, in some very large groups where it's very disorganized. And then once you get to a point where you have people that maybe could be working together, but aren't for whatever reason, right? Just whatever reason. Um, and they start noticing each other's work and they start propping up each other's work and they start, you know, when it's good, they start calling out each other. You see this kind of, um, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of people like, you know, who, who made it to mountaintops noticing there's someone else on a mountaintop calling over going, Hey, did you, how'd you do on that climb right there? Right. Like, and there's this, and the thing is that that is a sign of a, of a very healthy organization that has people in it that feel good about the organization and want to see the organization grow in a healthy way and have pride in that organization. And the fact that Elizondo and some of these people are starting to do this, where they just start reaching over and just kind of, to me, that's a, it's a, it's a very interesting psychological sign. Very much. Tim, you want to weigh in here? I think the Ross Colehart drop was huge. Um, you know, that that's a pretty big information drop in my personal opinion. And demonstrating, again, the fact that this uh, phenomenon is not limited by anything. It can go anywhere. Uh, I think speaks to the volumes to the fact that people like Louis, Luis Elizondo have been saying for a while that this phenomenon is everywhere. And I think even history will show that this tra these transmedium objects have been going into volcanoes, into water, into mountainsides, and all over the place. So we can well, only assume that they'll be in the bottom of our oceans as well. Well, and, and, that, and that's the important, important point to, to focus on is that, you know, if you really look at some of the hypotheses as to how these systems are working, if you look at what I would consider to be one of the more pragmatic explanations for it, which is a, a, a sort of, um, a, a, of a, for lack of a better term, a warp field, a displacement field of some sort, right? Um, you can kind of, you can, you can kind of see how, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, ends up kind of dovetailing together. It's, it's kind of interesting either way it's playing out. All right, let's move on to topic number two here, John, because we got a great unbiased UFO report going on tonight. And your your scientific crush, Gary Nolan, making news again. What do you got yeah. for us? We got three he's minutes. Beating, he's still my beating heart. Oh no, 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 no. I need a whole hour for Gary. Um so um uh so <laughs> you, you it, need this a whole is twenty four hours for Gary. So, so, um, so you, you got to listen to the, the, the message, but basically what it is, is it, it's Gary talking to, um, I believe it was Elizondo and Kale, I think if I remember correctly. Um, and he's basically talking about, he's basically, he's basically, um, 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 he's, he's imagining, right. He's, 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 he's basically allowing his, his non-scientific mind to speculate on what the, the possibilities are. And what he speculates about is the fact that because of the, the, the potentially quantum nature of, of many of our biological systems, because of, of what we're learning about how we all work now, to assume that there aren't adjacent fields that we might have some ability to interact with or gain information from or share information with, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's, you know, he, he, did, he just considers it kind of illogical. Right. And so to me, it was just it was very interesting because he was really kind of um, offering an out in a way um, for explaining why current science can't really get a, their, their hands around this very well. You know, and, and, and to me, it was very, very interesting. But it was also an incredibly thought provoking you know, statement for Gary to make. And and like I said, he doesn't speculate very often. So whatever he does, it's fun. Okay, so what's he speculating on? What he's basically speculating on is is what is what what aren't we seeing? What is the nature of what we aren't seeing, and why is it that we might not be seeing it? And and basically talking about the fact that because of the fact that we have we we now have this awareness of how some of the systems in our own body appear to work. And because we know that those systems have the ability to 
perform certain near and and, and even far field activities based on on you know field access and so forth that that no one should discount the possibility that there are other fields that there are other things that we just haven't been able to detect yet that are adjacent to us in some way that our brains do interact with either in a light or heavy way and 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 that might explain some of what we're seeing and so it's 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 speculation at its finest but it's speculation by someone who doesn't normally speculate and so you know it's it's fun to listen to very fun to listen to. Uh, we got about thirty seconds. Gary Nolan once again is is very hot on the idea that there are phenomena happening around the world, and I'm very curious if you think going into the next half hour here, if you think that Gary will be breaking some major news here as 2022 moves forward. Uh, well, I would say I would say it a different way. I would say that that if there is news that falls into his domain, absolutely, because I think it's pretty safe to say that that he's become very very attached to South LA. All right, the fedora wearing John Hudson and special guest Tim Sinar. We continue the unbiased UFO report when we return on Spaced Out Radio for the final half hour, right after this. Aw, uh, Gary blocked you, Julie? I didn't know that. What are you doing there, John? Speaking. Henry, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I just I just saw the post. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just saw the a post from, 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 a good, you know, from a good friend. just felt bad. I apologize. Lyle Myers, welcome to SOR Chat. Luke99, good to see you. Uh, by the way, Luis Elizondo will be on this show April 28th. April 28th. Put it How on your calendar. I it's really him. <laughs> well, I don't him. know. I don't know anymore since he shaved the chin hair and went with the full beard. How I mean, you have to assume that stories? someone in his role that he used to have at one point or another had a body double and that person's probably unemployed at this point. So, you know, <laughs> just saying, see, that's the kind of that, I mean, I gotta be honest, that is the kind of crap that goes on that people actually take for fact and then actually start building hypotheses on. And that's where it starts. I mean, it sucks because it's so much fun to do, but when people start using it as a, as a leap, as a leap off point, it's freaking <laughs> terrifying. You're so right. You're so right. Conspiracy <laughs> is is fun to dabble in, but I wouldn't want to live there. No, it's great in the it's great in the shallow end. It's really fun in the shallow end. It's tremendous yeah. fun in the shallow end. It's even sometimes yeah. fun to look into the deep end and go, "Wow, look at that!" You know. Yeah, I start getting really existential and questioning whether I'm even here, and then there's problems. I just can't. Oh know. yes. Oh oh. <laughs> Do I? Oh, oh. oh yes. Oh yes. Yeah, but no, I'm curious, for, 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 for you, because um, uh, um, if I remember correctly, so this all started for, in 2019 for you, is that correct? That's right. Ballpark. Yeah. So so we're talking, uh, like, I, I should know this, but it, what, it three, no, it's got to be more than three years. No, it has been three years. Okay, three years. So in that time period, has, has how you feel about death changed? No. No. Not at all? No, 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 there's no real link to death per okay. se. No, yeah. no, no, that's totally, no, no, totally fine. Now, what about, um, um, what about like, like how, like how, how heavy have you been pulled into consciousness type studies? Um, so there's a guy named Terry Hall in, in the chat here yep. and he's kind of been, like I said, my UFO mentor, UFO doctor, he lives out here in Oregon. And, um, he kind of turned me on to that, uh, aspect of things. Okay, so, so you've, you've looked into it and, and you've, you've researched a bit. So the only reason yeah. I'm asking these questions is, and there's no right or wrong answers is I have a hypothesis that I'm playing with that essentially there's a story arc that, that becomes common and that in certain periods of the story arc, we all end up, going to similar topics and and coming to kind of similar realizations that we then have to carry with us on to the next phase and um 
and 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 I, one of my hypotheses is that everyone gets dragged into consciousness at some point. My another hypothesis is that everyone except for Dave um, lose their fear of death. Yeah, no, lose I'm their not. fear of death. I never yeah. had a fear of death to start. Well, then then you're then so you're, and then, and it hasn't changed yeah. at all. Um, yeah, then you're you're good. I'm totally at, at peace with that. But um, I mean, yeah, no, that, that's interesting. Interesting well, connection. It, well, and, and the thing is that for me, these connections, the ones that I remember are the ones that also have a personal attribute to them. Right. And, and, you know, and me, like everyone else, like I got into this field for physics, physics. I was actually taking physics at Stanford at the time when I started getting back into like, it was all about yeah. the physics. Right. Right. And, and then, and then Grant, <laughs> Grant Kim and Grant dragged me down this horrible rabbit hole of consciousness and next thing i know i'm learning about freaking like ndes and mediums and ectoplasm and like all this yeah. creepy stuff and and but you start seeing patterns and you start seeing good researchers doing good stuff and you're like right hmm well these are odd. really these are intellectuals these are deep thinkers and they're able to see beyond what's right in front of their face and so when they're confronted by something that could have a link they follow it a hundred percent to oh, yeah. you know to discover oh, everything yeah. oh for, yeah yeah for and i think that that's necessary in a field like this however i Good personally enough, um i understand that there is probably a connection with consciousness um and you know i'm not sure i think it's potentially totally human created you know what i mean like we've just yeah created that yep. to kind of box it if you will in a way and that guys, would be more i, I, gotta, get, Go I gotta cut you off right there because yeah, we gotta uh, come back here thank you to the super chatters it's and right. here we go with the final half hour stick around for the after show after we get done here stay tuned We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with the unbiased UFO report. We have the fedora wearing John Hudson. Our guest of the evening, Tim Senor, continues to be with us. And John, I know we're going to uh, continue on with Gary Nolan here for just a moment or two, but, you know, at first here, you know, Gary Nolan to me, and I've said this before a couple of weeks ago when we were talking to him right now, in my opinion, is one of the most pe important people we should be following if you have any interest in the science behind UFOs and ET contact. You know, Whether he wants to be or not. Yes, I agree with you. <laughs> I think he wants to. I think he I, wants I, to. I, I, I think He's a surprising amount of it is. Yeah, I agree with you. I think a surprising amount of it is. He is not letting it break his study. He's not letting it go to his head. He's very focused regarding it. Okay. But the fact that he was just on Martin Willis's podcast, I believe, with Lou Elizondo, I mean, I'm not sure if you had an opportunity to catch any of that or not. But, I mean, the fact is, these bigwigs now, they seem to be starting to team up a little bit on these different shows and trying to mutually get these messages out. Have you noticed that recently as well? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that's been so... Um, um, I, you know, I think it's just such Break a good... Up, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, that's something that I think has just been so nice to see because I, you know, I... Um, I'm someone that tends to look 
at things that are from multiple points of view. And one of the things I like to look at is the, the relative health of an organism, a social organism. And to me, one of the best signs of it is when you start seeing people feeling good enough and strong enough and confident enough in their own research, that they start looking across the water and noticing what other people are doing and start calling out the stuff they like and calling out the stuff that they believe in and, and, you know, and helping to, to advertise and, and, and spread the word about things that they, that they, they, they endorse and so forth. And to me, it's, um, it's an incredibly healthy sign. It's, it's, it's really good. It's a good indication for an organization. All right, Tim, do you have any thoughts on, on how a lot of these uh, gentlemen now who are in the higher echelons of UFO research seem to be teaming up to go on these podcasts now for multiple messages at once? And thank goodness they are because, um, you know, they obviously are working together. They're able to corroborate each other's work. Um, they're demonstrating their schedule and talking about their plan. Um, it sounds like a team on a mission, um, you know, collaborating scientists with people in government, with lawyers, you're covering all bases. And so the fact that they're taking time out of their schedules to come on our show, and if they have to come in in groups or singular, however they're coming out and talking to us on any show, I think is amazing. You know, that keeping us in the loop, making us feel like we're part of disclosure, teaching us how to become an advocate towards this. I think it's it's part of their mission um, of disclosure and transparency to start it out in the grassroots ways that we're seeing them do it right now. I think it's a sign of things to come. I think it's just the beginning. And I think we can expect a lot more. We're going to get pages and pages of information at some point. You're going to be sick of reading data. You know, I look forward to that. But I think that's coming. I think it's coming too. All right, let's get to the, the final topic of the night. Daniel <laughs> Sheehan shares a an interesting story, John. Yeah, yeah. So um, so kind of uh, actually once again on this whole topic, wh what we really had this week is we had a whole bunch of clips from different uh, interviews being shared on Twitter, and they were very carefully clipped clips um, that uh, each kind of illustrated an, an interesting topic. And some of them were a little more uh, thought uh, provoking and requiring than I expected, like Mr. Sheehan. So Mr. Sheehan gave um, the kind of story that you would typically hear from like your grandfather sitting on a porch, you know, maybe involving, you know, some frogs or something. And, um, and, and basically it's, it's, but it's a really interesting story, but to kind of sum up the story, the, what the story is about is it when, when you find a creature that you know nothing about, you might believe that you're doing something to help them. And it might appear completely obvious to everyone in your species that that is the right way to help them. But if you don't actually know how they work, you could be harming them in ways that don't just harm, you know, one aspect of them, basically destroy their entire lives, right? And, and that was basically the, 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 the gist of the story. And, and to me, it was, um, it was kind of a weird thing for Danny Sheehan to be talking about because, like, why would you be telling that story unless you were fearful that, that there were some other species that might make that mistake with us? Well, Daniel Sheehan has been let in on a lot of information that he is just itching to get out. But unfortunately, due to like lawyer, yeah, due to lawyer and uh, uh, and uh, filibustering, <laughs> yeah. Do, do, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Client, uh, uh, oh, clear, uh, yeah, 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 privilege. Yeah, the privileges, the silence that goes along with that. You know, Daniel has been very, very careful with what he words and what he releases. Do you think that maybe, just maybe, Elizondo and others whom he is representing are allowing him to maybe break out a little pieces of information? That he, because he knows what he can and cannot say, and he won't break that attorney-client privilege. Yeah, but you know, honestly, um, I, I, you know, I've heard Danny Sheehan talk many times, and um, and basically, what he always talks about is the fact that whenever he meets with anybody, no matter who they are, he makes it very, very clear to them that absolutely 
anything that they show to him will go public. <laughs> like he makes that very clear, even when to do so is completely out of context and questionably legal. He will say that, right? He says that all the time. Now, there's a ton of things that Elizondo can't say directly to Sheehan because it would be client privilege. And if it didn't endanger Elizondo, uh, I mean, it just gets complicated, right? But if if Elizondo went around with Sheehan and introduced him and got all the right people to say to Sheehan what Elizondo can't, now he can protect what he's heard from Elizondo and he can sing like a jaybird about every other thing he hears. Very true. And that's Very I mean, true. Let's think about that Mark 12 plane that he talked about. Like, like, like that that whole that whole presentation should have been cut off midstream and Danny should have just vanished off the face of the earth. Like just poof, nothing happened. I don't get it. No, I, I get that. I get that. But and I know Danny is somebody who wants full on disclosure, but he also knows a lot of information that he hasn't passed through. He can make the Grant Cameron statement all he wants that if you say it to me, it's going public. But in the end, attorney client privilege still has a lot of rules that he has to follow. Yeah, no, no, no. But that was the that was the distinction I'm making is that that's that's what he says to everyone that he meets with on the behalf of his clients. He never says that to his clients, right? It's always the people that he's talking to on behalf of his clients. So whenever he meets with anyone with his client, he tells that person, anything you share with me in this case for my client, I'm going to go public with. Right. That's what I, I mean, he doesn't do it to the clients themselves. Tim, what's your thoughts? I, I love Danny's analogies that he makes in his discussions. And um, I always interpret them a little bit differently, but I must say um, in this last one, my interpretation was that we're operating on a certain physics and let's call that a language. They're operating on a different, entirely different physics. And let's call that a 10 entirely different language. So for us to even start interpreting or having a, a dialogue, we're, you know, we need to start rethinking this. We can't just be taking down random UAPs because what's the message we're delivering with that was kind of my interpretation what are your thoughts? No, I mean, I, I think you might be right. I, I hope you're wrong just because I don't, I don't really, I don't, I don't really agree with the, with the, with the premise in that, you know, um, I, you know, I can, I can talk to a lot of people about far simpler concepts without ever having to ensure that they understand three dimensional physics. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, you know, you, 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 especially if the, especially if the upper the upper party has an interest in communicating right um so to me it's just but, but you, i mean i think i think i think what you said could very likely be an accurate uh, interpretation of what he said i'm just saying i hope not just because i don't agree with it that's all right that's that's very interesting what do you think danny is going to do here if the aoi msg gets its way and completely shuts down any more videos or information or public talk about UFOs outside of the report that is supposed to come every six months if it's not delayed. Well, honestly, um, that taps into the um, the other thing I wanted to talk about tonight, which got bumped over here enough time, and that is that Elizondo finally, and I'm really sorry they didn't cover this earlier because I wanted to, but I couldn't find the information, um, he finally talked about amnesty, okay? And uh, which, I mean, I mean, I can go back. I've been asking for amnesty for like seven, eight years. I've always believed this. It was the only way, it was the only way forward was amnesty. And uh, what he's talking about is not full amnesty. I like his method better. What he's talking about is, is a temporary amnesty, a six month amnesty that says, hey, for the next six months, anyone that knows anything is completely legally free from all NDAs, from all vows, from all everything, right? But if that six months passes and on the trail for information, we discover that you were withholding information and you did not take advantage of that six month window, you will be prosecuted. I thought it was a really interesting approach to it. And I would argue that 
if if that picks up the steam that I expect it to, that is what you're going to see Danny Sheehan focused on. That is actually quite brazen, considering the fact that Elizondo is still a government contractor and talking about these subjects with Congress people and senators. Yeah, the the challenge is is it is it when if, even when you are a a a wholly owned contractor of the U.S. government, meaning that you are not paid through an intermediate and you're being paid, which I don't even know. I could, I'm sure they do it with somebody. Um, it, it's still different than being like an internal like employee, right? And so, um, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I the, the reason why I make that point is to say that that for Elizondo to be working for a defense contractor um, uh, that that basically holds his tickets for the for the government, um, it it. He's not as beholden to the government as he was before. He has a much, he has a, he has potentially a much longer leash because of the fact that there's a there's an intermediate company between him and, and the government. Tim, what's your thoughts? Well, if all else fails with AOI MSG, it's pretty clear Danny plans on attacking how these reports are being classified. He's very clear in stating that. Um, this current security state apparatus wants to keep this stuff secret and that this, the way it's currently set up, it's violating internal standards for classification and it violates the rights of the people in Congress that have a right to that information. And it's illegal to have it classified in this form, period. And he's right. That is, he's not overextending that. I mean, he might be exaggerating aspects of it, but fundamentally he is dead on you look at the entire nature the entire meaning that drives the entire classification system we we've 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 tread far off the trail um probably for good reasons to be honest with you but it doesn't change the fact that we've tread pretty far off the trail harking the silence of the air force but, but i will say that that i think to the point that you just brought up the reason why Danny Sheen is so yeah, no, the reason why Danny Sheen is so valuable is because he takes these very, um, for the most part, unpredictable um, approaches to the problem. Right? Um, you know, him, him attacking it from the point of view of you know of of um, of how Elizondo was treated with his emails. Him looking at what you just brought up. Him looking at amnesty. Right? He he doesn't he doesn't attack them head on. He looks for auxiliary issues that could have as much impact on the system, and he attacks those. It's a very, very clever strategic approach, and it's, it's awesome to see in someone in his role, and I think that's what makes him somewhat unique.